Okay, so if, if we're ready to go, I'd like to introduce first speaker, Taylor Skoken, and he's going to talk about something. Uh, investigating the role of microtubule minus N proteins in non-centrosomal microtubule organization. It's too long. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity, and thank you all for coming uh, today. Um, oh, my name is Taylor Skoken again. Um, I'm a student in Jessica Feldman's lab at Stanford University, and today I'll be telling you a little bit about non-centrosomal microtubule organization. Okay, so the microtubules are involved in many cellular processes. Uh, arguably the best characterized of those is formation of the bipolar spindle in mitotic cells. After differentiation, however, there's no longer a need for the spindle, and so many cells undergo a dramatic reorganization of their microtubule cytoskeleton. And there's important cellular structures known as microtubule organizing centers, or MTOCs, that are responsible for imparting this organization. So the centrosome is the canonical MTOC, giving rise to the radial array of microtubules we see in a dividing cell. But other structures can take over the role of MTOC, including the apical membrane in epithelial cells after differentiation. And so we know a lot about centrosomal MTOCs, but we know very little actually about the non-centrosomal MTOCs, including simple questions like what proteins are required for establishing those sites. So just to orient you, uh, non-centrosomal microtubule organizing centers are found in many tissues in C. elegans. Uh, the embryonic intestine is particularly useful for studying this. So I'm showing here dorsal and lateral views of the embryo, and you can see in the dotted line where the intestine sits with relation to the embryo. So the intestinal progenitor undergoes a rapid series of, of divisions to give rise to this E16 or 16 cell stage intestine at which point the cells undergo an apico-basal poli uh, polarization where you see the nuclei and the centrosomes polarized to that apical membrane, as you can see here. So if we look at the microtubules in this system, you see in the early intestine, while it's dividing, microtubules organize around the centrosomes. But after polarization, we see the microtubules nucleated and stabilized at the apical membrane. And so you can see that here especially well in this image depicting a mutant in which the nuclei don't polarize completely to the apical membrane. So we can see that space uh, filled by microtubules. So the microtubules themselves are these uh, intrinsically polar polymers. Uh, they have a highly dynamic plus end and a relatively stable minus end. And that stability is provided by their localization to the MTOC, which generally is enriched for proteins that associate with the minus N and are required for stabilizing, nucleating, and anchoring uh, those microtubules. And so these include things like gamma tubulin, the dominant microtubule nucleator, and it's interacting proteins uh, GIP1 and GIP2, which partner to form the gamma tubulin small complex or gamma tusk. So additional proteins do localize to these minus ends and MTOCs and are involved in uh, microtubule organization, such as Petronin and NOCA1. So uh, it should come as no surprise then with the role for stabilizing microtubules that these minus end associated proteins uh, are frequently move uh, in coordination with the reassignment of the MTOC function. So here in this left image, you can see a uh, fusion protein of gamma tubulin localized to the centrosomes in the early dividing intestine. But after polarization here on the right at E16, we see the majority of that gamma tubulin is actually redistributed to the apical membrane. And a similar pattern of redistribution is seen for the gamma tusk interacting partners, GIP1 and GIP2. Uh, and despite not seeing centrosomal localization of Petronin and NOCA1, we do see at polarization that they localize to the apical membrane, just like uh, the gamma tusk proteins. So given these localization data, we're really interested in understanding, first, which of the proteins are actually required for establishing and maintaining these non-centrosomal MTOCs. So to do this, we first focused on one of the gamma tusk proteins, GIP1, 
But the problem we face with any of these is that they're required for divisions. And so conventional knockouts lead to early embryonic arrest. And that prevents us from ever looking at uh, later developing tissues for roles for these proteins. So to get around this, what we've actually done is used an endogenous protein degradation pathway that's mediated by the protein ZIF1. So ZIF1, as a uh, mediator of degradation, was first discovered and characterized by Geraldine Seydoux in her lab. And it's used to degrade germline fate determinants in the early somatic embryo, or sorry, the early embryo in the somatic cells. So if we consider it in its most basic form, it's a generally a two-component system requiring one, this ZIF1 protein, which is a recognition subunit of the E3 ubiquitin ligase complex, and target proteins containing a, a particular zinc finger one motif. And so previously, Jeremy Nance has shown that this can be repurposed for tissue-specific degradation by introducing the ZF1 tag into a protein of interest and then ectopically expressing ZIF1 in the tissues where you seek degradation. So we've done this uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 editing for GIP1, as you can see in this cartoon. But we still face the challenge that endogenous ZIF1 is present in all somatic cells in the early embryo. And so this leads to a degradation of our ZF1-tagged GIP1, which ultimately leads to embryonic arrest. And so fortunately, we found that uh, ZIF1 mutant is incapable of degrading the ZF1-tagged proteins. And what that means is that uh, we have a background available for introducing the ZF1 tag to GIP1, allowing for normal development, uh, and only upon reintroducing ZIF1 into the embryo do we see tissue-specific degradation. And so just as a proof of principle, here you can see localization of our ZF1 GFP tagged GIP1 uh, with the intestine again outlined. And upon introduction of an intestine-specific ZIF1, we see robust degradation in the intestine alone, and we can, of course, put other markers in the intestine as well. So for the first time, we can now begin asking for these essential proteins like GIP1. Are they required for forming the MTOCs? And you can, of course, consider both centrosomal and membrane MTOCs since the proteins found at both sites. So very briefly, to... Um, to show you the consequences of loss of GIP1 uh, at the centrosomal MTOCs, presumably its role there is for forming the bipolar spindle, and so we expected that uh, GIP1 depletion would lead to mitotic defects in these embryos. So to look at this, we uh, looked at intestinal nuclear numbers as a proxy for intestinal cell counts, and we did this at the E16 stage embryo, where 16 intestinal cells are, are expected. And as we expected, GIP1 depletion led to a significant reduction in the intestinal nuclear number. And uh, the intestinal nuclei in these cases are generally enlarged, often disorganized with respect to one another and irregular in shape. So that may not be unexpected. What we were more interested in was really understanding the role of GIP1 at these apical membrane MTOCs. And so our first question was, is GIP1 required to recruit the other gamma tusk components? And so you can see, under normal circumstances, um, GIP2 and gamma tubulin localize with GIP1 to the apical membrane in a polarized intestine. And upon GIP1 depletion, we see a complete loss of that apical localization for both proteins. So this suggests not only is GIP1 required to recruit the remaining gamma tusk components, but it also, importantly, demonstrates that any residual GIP1 left behind after our degradation methods is insufficient to localize this common nucleating machinery to the apical membranes. So we also know that the microtubules themselves are important for establishing the apical basal polarity of the intestine in the embryo. And so we were curious whether disrupting uh, GIP1 localization would affect that basic polarization. So to look at this, we looked, uh, we stained for an apical polarity marker PAR3. You can see here that PAR3 in red co-localizes with our GFP-tagged GIP1 at the uh, apical membrane of the embryonic intestine. 
And unlike the gamma tusks, upon GIP1 depletion, seen here, we don't affect the apical localization of PAR3. So they are establishing this foundational uh, polarity in the intestine. And it's really interesting in this case because it's suggesting that despite losing these common nucleators in the gamma tusk, we're still seeing the microtubules performing their typical role in establishing that apical basal polarity. So we were, of course, interested then in looking at the microtubules. Here you can see just a reminder of that apical localization at polarization with the microtubules uh, heavily enriched at this apical membrane. And upon GIP1 depletion, we were very surprised to see that uh, not only are the microtubules still abundant in these embryos, but the localization to the apical membrane is virtually indistinguishable from control embryos. And so this is suggesting that there are pathways completely independent of the gamma tusk uh, that are allowing for apical polarization of microtubules uh, and uh, possibly nucleation and stabilization. So we next considered candidates for this alternate pathway or parallel pathway that's independent of gamma tubulin. And so um, one of those coming from work from the Ogama lab was uh, Petronin, which has been shown actually in the, in the adult skin of C. elegans to have an independent role in microtubule organization from gamma tubulin. So I'll just remind you, this does localize to the apical membrane, but in order to serve this role in the intestine of independently giving rise to microtubule organization, it must persist in the absence of GIP1. And so we looked in a GIP1 depleted embryo and still see Patronin is localized to the apical membrane, suggesting that it could be our, our protein involved in this independent pathway. So our next step then was to try to perturb this, and what we actually did was we uh, looked at a GIP1 depletion embryo in a Patronin null background. And so you can see here on the right that in the absence of both GIP1 and Patronin, while there are some uh, potential architectural defects in the embryo, we do see an apical enrichment that appears relatively normal when compared to the normal GIP1 depleted embryo or wild type for that matter. And so this suggests that there's uh, further pathways involved that we are actively uh, exploring at this moment. And so just as a, a brief summary, I've told you about our use of the intestinal, uh, the embryonic intestine as a model for understanding microtubule organization. Um, we now have a system in place using this ZIF1 mutant in combination with pre-existing tools to degrade early essential proteins in the later arising tissues of the embryo. And that the microtubules in the, at the apical MTOC in the intestine appear to actually be nucleated and or stabilized by pathways independent of both the gamma tusk and patronin. And so with that, I'd like to thank my entire lab, especially Jessica Feldman, for her tremendous support. Uh, a couple of rotation students were involved in some of the work seen here. So Brian was responsible for characterizing the ZIF1 allele, and uh, Claire provided the GIP1 patronin double mutant information. And then I'd like to thank all of these people for their generous sharing of reagents and uh, these sources for lab funding. I can take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll just ask one question. So in, where are you? Um, so in, in, in these cells, when you get rid of GIF1, are they, despite the fact that they have microtubules, are they, are they defective in any way? Because in the early embryo, when you get rid of gamma, there are a lot of microtubules. It's almost no change. So gamma tubulin is clearly not nucleating, per se, microtubules. And so I'm just wondering if these have other defects, despite the appearance of microtubules? Right. So um, it's difficult to get at that because the physiological assays for this are challenging. What we do see, though, is that even with... Um, even with these significant losses in the microtubule nuclei, most of these uh, worms actually survive into adulthood, suggesting they're surviving with dramatically reduced intestines anyway. I have a question. So why did the centrosomes move to the apical surface? 
if the apical surface can form independently. Do the, you, you see what I'm saying? Oh, so I believe it's an association with the nuclear envelope, but I'm not certain of that. 